For centuries in the Western European art tradition, the nude had been central to an artist's practice. It had been integral to their training, so learning human anatomy through drawing from live models in the classroom. And later, when successfully executed, it was considered to be the pinnacle of creative endeavor, an embodiment of beauty and truth. However, women artists faced a number of difficulties in drawing from the nude. So towards the end of the 19th century, more women than ever were enrolling at art school, but they were barred from drawing from the nude in the classroom. It was thought to be morally dangerous, corrupting, destructive of their innocence and their virtue. And those were considered to be some of the most valuable assets that women possessed at that time, particularly if you wanted to be marriageable afterwards. So what that meant was women uh, drew from casts of classical sculpture or from the draped body, but that meant that they were unable really to access the nude in the same way as male artists. These restrictions severely hindered women's uh, development as artists. Ethel Walker, who was born in 1861, she attended Putney School of Art and the Westminster School of Art, and it was highly unlikely that she would have seen a nude uh, in those contexts. She then enrolled at the Slade School of Art in 1893. Now, the Slade had really pioneered women's education and had made a name for itself by um, offering places to women on equal terms to men and even mixing them in certain classrooms, which was considered to be very radical. But even there, even at the Slade, um, women were barred from the life room until 1898. So it seems like Walker was actually probably about a decade too young to really benefit from those advances herself. These restrictions all informed Walker's 1916 nude, The Silence of the Ravine. For a woman artist like Walker, to paint the nude was to talk back to these restrictions on your ambitions. And despite small changes in the curriculum to more, in more liberal institutions, it was still a radical act. From its earliest iterations, uh, male artists had used the nude to create fantasies about the desirability and availability of female bodies. Nudes were fraught with issues of power, possession, subordination, and they were very much the product of the heteronormative, patriarchal society in which they were made. For a woman artist like Walker, Painting the nude was challenging an art historical tradition that reinforced women's status as desire objects, um, and also a genre that, um, from its earliest instances, I think, was communicating implicitly a heteronormative dynamic. Men are active, they observe, they paint. Women are passive, they're receptacles, they're decorative. And Walker was not only a woman artist, she was also a queer artist, which further challenged um, assumptions about spectatorship and desire, which resided at the very center of the nude. So I think for Walker, she reclaimed the genre of the nude as a vehicle for queer intimacy and queer eroticism, and as a fresh means of exploring female embodiment. Homosexuality between men was illegal in 1916 when this was painted. But the existence of queer women was disregarded to such an extent that it wasn't even acknowledged through legal injunctions. It was believed to be better not to notice them, not to advertise them, in the words of the Conservative MP John Moore Brabazon in 1921. And so what this meant was in public life, in art, literature, culture of all kinds, uh, queer women were consistently erased and struggled for any kind of visibility. And that's what makes Walker's nude all the more striking. Um, and this is probably one of the first known examples, as far as I can tell, of a queer woman artist painting the nude. When Walker was still at art school, when she was 19, um, she met the artist Clara Christian, and the two began living and working together in Christian's house in Chelsea. Um, we know that they had a relationship for a number of years after that, um, although Christian um, later married and very tragically died in childbirth, um, very young. Um, but Walker continued to live in the house that they had shared in Chelsea for the rest of her working life. The Renaissance nude reconfigured the female body as a series of soft, smooth, harmonious lines. When you look at these female bodies, they're kind of, they're hairless, but they also look kind of boneless. It's all about emphasizing their malleability, their pliability, their youth. There's quite a lot about Walker Sitter that unsettles these norms. Walker emphasizes awkward angles and restless movement conveyed through the model's raised leg, twisted torso, raised shoulders, and the kind of obscuring of her chin. Rather than coquettishly meeting the viewer's gaze, her eyes are cast down in contemplation. And there's also a kind of androgyny to Walker's nude. 
Her arms and legs are where our attention is drawn rather than her breasts and her hips, and she has the cropped hair of a modern woman. With the history of the nude, often titles are very simple and they're very descriptive. So it'll be standing female nude, reclining nude, whereas Walker chooses a deliberately enigmatic and poetic title, Silence of the Ravine. First of all, I think what this does is that it takes us away from a simple examination of the female body. It suggests there's something kind of deeper in what she's trying to explore. I think it also possibly relates to the fact that Walker would later in her life become interested in mysticism and in the occult. One of the other things that this kind of brings to mind for me as well is a ravine is a valley forged by a torrent of water. So it's aligning the female body with a kind of powerful elemental force. This is not a kind of frail, decorative, passive woman. This is a woman full of kind of mysterious, powerful um, meaning 